Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Matt Stouffer. Uh, unfortunately, our president, uh, Suzanne Hurton Roberts, could not be with us tonight, but she sends everyone her best. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Mercedes Fabian. Uh, Dr. Fabian is a forensic anthropologist uh, out of New York who works as a lecturer and lab director in the human biology division of the anthropology department at the University of Albany. Uh, her academic career focuses on human anatomy and medical topics, but she's also an active member of the Cold Case Analysis Center at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York, as well as the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases. Uh, she's also a volunteer consultant with the New York State Police. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm going to hop over and pull up my PowerPoint. Okay. Let me get all this other stuff out of the way. All right, so first, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'll be talking about how forensic anthropology, like I said on the screen, is more than just bones. Um, so just a brief disclaimer before I start my presentation, because I know not everyone here uh, has a lot of exposure to forensics. I'll be talking about cases toward the end of my presentation, and I just kind of want everyone to be aware that some of the subject matter might be a little disturbing. Um, it's not too, too graphic, but I prefer to let everybody know before I start. So for my presentation today, uh, for my talk, I'm going to go over what forensic anthropology is. I know some of you are forensic anthropologists, so sorry for going over the same thing, um, but I know some people here don't have um, an idea of basically what we do as forensic anthropologists. I'm going to talk about my unique education and background uh, because it's very relevant to the discussion. Uh, then go into a little bit of human anatomy, especially education in it, death scene investigation, same kind of thing. Um, cold case analysis centers, and I'll talk about the one that I belong to. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some case studies, ones that are currently being investigated and others that I've assisted on. And then we'll finish it up with questions. Also, I tend to talk fast virtually because I'm not moving around like I normally am. So if you need me to slow down, just let me know. So a little bit about me and my background. Uh, I'm going to start this talk discussing about it because, like I said, it's relevant to my unique approach to this field. Uh, I went to the State University of New York in Fredonia for my bachelor's. There I majored in criminal justice and sociology and minored in anthropology. And while I was there, uh, I spent time interning with the Chautauqua County District Attorney's Office and then also the Chautauqua County Sheriff's Department, um, specifically the crime scene unit. I was originally going to be a police officer, but because of multiple injuries <laughs> before the ankle one, which we were just talking about, uh, I couldn't really go to the academy because of them. And so I decided to continue on in forensics uh, and do physical anthropology in graduate school specializing in forensics. Um, and so I went to the University of Buffalo in New York. So while earning my master's, I performed research on post-burial time estimation. I looked at different element levels in buried pig mandibles over a six month time period to see how different element levels changed, if they changed at predictable rates, and if those rates could be used to help with the determination of time of death, basically time of discovery to time of, um, between the time of discovery from the actual time of death um, so that's post-burial time estimation. For my dissertation, I shifted focus and examined ligament entheses. So this means ligament attachment sites uh, in the knee and shoulder in order to determine if injury to those sites could indicate prior involvement, specifically in athletics or any kind of um, injury prior. The goal of my study was to determine if a relationship actually existed between the development of what's called enthesopathies, so pathologies or uh, irregularities on the actual attachment site and athletic participation and also to look at current assumptions about the emphases. Um, so in television and um, a lot of kind of old school anthropologists will talk about how you can determine someone's career choice or athletic involvement based on the way their bones look if they're very robust or rough or a little damaged um, and that's not really the case. Wolf's Law about bone adapting to stress um, has caused physical anthropologists to really assume this. 
Um, so there's thinking that it can determine behavior or occupation of an individual. In reality, it really can't. So that's what my dissertation looked at. And my education really focused on human anatomy overall, not just the skeletal system, which is very different for a lot of anthropologists. Uh, while at the University of Buffalo, I volunteered with the Specialized Medical Assistance Response Team, specifically the Mass Fatality Division. And this really gave me the opportunity to um, help with autopsies at the Medical Examiner's Office of Erie County. Um, there I got to attend a lot of different autopsies and actually see different forensic cases um, in person. I attended different educational field schools about human identification and death scene archaeology. And then I also spent some time in Hawaii on Hickam's Air Force Base um, at the Central Identification Laboratory, where my focus was on a project developed by Dr. Carl Stefan using radiographs and found human remains to identify lost American soldiers from the Korean War. So for this, we the radiographs were taken before the soldiers were sent overseas in order to identify men with tuberculosis who wouldn't be sent. The radiographs were then kept in their files um, and missing soldiers with radiographs on file would be compared to, um, their files would be compared to the unidentified remains that were brought back. Um, and basically we used where they were last known, where the remains were found, et cetera, to kind of try to link them together in addition to comparing the radiographs to the remains. Um, here we focused on the clavicle and the vertebral column. Um, they were the best skeletal elements to compare with the radiographs. Uh, after earning my doctorate, I accepted a position at the University of, Buff uh, <laughs> University of Albany. <laughs> um, and that's where I am currently. So I am a lecturer and also a lab director for U Albany. I'm in the human biology division of the anthropology department. Um, I teach a number of courses and labs depending on what time of year it is. Um, and these include human anatomy and physiology, human evolution, uh, misguided medicine, forensic anthropology, and then healthcare serial killers, which is uh, one of my favorites to teach. <laughs> uh, and since my graduation, I've become a level one death scene investigator, um, and I've spent time volunteering at the New York State Museum, inventorying human skeletal remains, and helping, um, as Matt said, with the New York State Police on a couple of cases, one with unidentified human remains, mostly just a skull, and another with a search for scattered human remains and clandestine graves on um, this past summer in the woods. <laughs> uh, I also got to visit the forensic anthropology department in New York City um, for a week and look at their cases um, because they have a whole department that works with uh, investigators over there. And now I currently um, am involved in different cold cases in Albany, New York, and Colony, and hopefully others um, in the next year. So what exactly is a forensic anthropologist? What do we do? Uh, so the basic definition, it's a physical anthropologist that uses their knowledge in a legal setting. So in this particular example, it's an expert in human osteology. So my argument is it should be a hu in, an expert in human anatomy as well. And that individual assists in the identification of unidentified uh, skeletonized remains. So forensic anthropologists provide investigators with as much uh, information as possible um, in reference to found unidentified human remains. And depending on the set of remains being examined, we look at age, sex, stature, uh, pathology, disease, trauma. And is trauma due to the crime, the discovery of the remains, and also just nature. Uh, age is determined by using the fusion of different bones in the body, and these occur at predictable rates. And so we're able to give an age range um, based on fusions of different bones. Also, we look at eruption of deciduous or basically your kid teeth and adult teeth. Again, they erupt at predictable times. Sex, um, biological sex, not gender, can be identified by observing what's called the oscoxa, so your pelvic bone. Um, you also use the skull. And then you can calculate stature by measuring long bones and placing the measurements in formulas that help um, kind of make up for or account for lost soft tissue and they give you a range for a height. So these methods, while not 100% accurate, are often combined with measurements from um, a program called Fordisk, and Fordisk will provide a statistical analysis uh, from these measurements that give you a percentage that the remains are likely male or female, um, and right now they also give you ancestry, etc. And so all of this combined hopefully leads to the identification of the individual and possibly the determination of the cause of death, time of death, 
et cetera. And basically, hopefully, it helps with the reconstruction of the crime. Um, I'll not, I'm not gonna lie, it's a very difficult field uh, in both the educational aspects and available career opportunities. Um, so why is that? Well, in my opinion, the field of forensic anthropology is changing. Um, at one point, forensic anthropologists were a group of physical anthropologists deemed experts on the skeletal system, and we still are. Uh, this group created forensic anthropology by using their expertise to assist law enforcement on cases with unidentified skeletal remains. Now, are they human? If they're human, who are they? What happened to them? Like I said, the goal is the same to answer the following, um, to answer the following from a set of unknown remains. So um, if they're human, can you give me age, sex, stature, all of this? And this would hopefully lead to the identification of the person and like I said, cause of death. Now there's a slow or very slow shift in the field that's redefining what we know about forensic anthropology. Um, so today the importance of context has been identified and now taphonomy, um, so what the environment has done to the set of remains versus what humans have actually done to them uh, is important and it's a very important aspect of forensic anthropology. So understanding how to read a scene is important as well. So it's not just the taphonomy, but everything else. So we should be able to take into account weather, soil type, animals that live in the area, other possible evidence that could be related to the crime if one occurred. Um, skeletonized remains are not found in pristine conditions and many are partially mummified. So there's leftover soft tissue on the remains. They're partially decomposed. They could be submerged in water. So a lot of the soft tissue is destroyed, but still there. Um, or badly burned. These are all cases that require the expertise of a forensic anthropologist. And this demonstrates what it is necessary for us to be able to identify soft tissue structures or what's left of them. Um, and furthermore, knowledge of the decomposition process can really help with identifying time of death, which is a very important aspect of a case involving human remains. Now, before this shift, police officers would bring a box of random bones collected from a crime scene to sometimes a college campus, most of the time a college campus, for a physical anthropologist, um, normally a professor, to identify and give whatever they can with the biological profile, creating forensic anthropology. Now it's really critical to ask the anthropologist to attend the scene with the crime scene technicians, detectives, and other officers. Bones in a box can only tell us so much. And while physical anthropologists understand evolution, the field itself seems to be kind of fighting change, um, fighting evolution. And many police departments and medical examiner's offices do not utilize our skills, making change that much more difficult. So if asked to attend a scene, there are really our specific educational requirements that in my opinion need to be met by the professional. So a lack of understanding of the criminal justice field and human anatomy and physiology can result in large and important pieces of the case being missed or misinterpreted. And this is the same from the criminal justice professional side of things not asking a forensic anthropologist to assist on a case can also lead to important pieces of a case being missed or misinterpreted um, or prolong the investigation. Uh, a major reason for the lack of interdisciplinary workmanship is due to a misunderstanding or lack of knowledge of the field of forensic anthropology. And because of this, I'd like to highlight these changes that should be made throughout the education of physical anthropologists who want to become forensic anthropologists. Um, and identify the specific skills and aptitudes aside from expertise on the human skeletal system that are necessary. So for human anatomy, um, many of you know, human, uh, adult humans have 206 individual bones and this, the body is programmed to form each bone as we know it in response to stresses and strains that are placed on the body throughout life. Every day, minute changes are occurring that continue to replace old bone with new and adjust itself to new environmental forces. Each bone has numerous anatomical landmarks that are formed because of life forces and or specific structures that either attach to the bone or interact with it in some way. So being able to identify each bone and their anatomical landmarks is necessary for physical anthropologists, but for many, their education into human anatomy kind of ends there. Um, but how can you truly understand the skeletal system and why it's shaped the way it is, why each individual landmark is placed in its own specific spot on the bone without really understanding the rest of the body? Um, how can you be considered an expert on the skeletal system without the ability to define the purpose of it and how it interacts with the rest of the, of the body? In my opinion, you really can't. Um, 
This is why it's important for physical anthropologists to really gain an education in human anatomy. And furthermore, I believe that taking courses with dissection requirements, specifically human dissections, is paramount to becoming an expert in the field. Um, this will educate further uh, future anthropologists in soft tissue and expose them to human variations that they will likely encounter in the field. I think it will also, forensic anthropologists will be able to recognize um, or begin to recognize things like rigor mortis, um, liver mortis, and algor mortis. So rigor mortis is a stiffening of the body after death. Algor mortis is a slow cooling of the body after death. And liver mortis, the pooling of blood after death. And all of this will help um, in determining what happened post-mortem, specifically determining time of death. I was fortunate um, in my education at the University of Buffalo, there's a medical school and they allowed anthropology students to attend and then actually help teach um, as TAs their gross anatomy class and many others. So experience taught me how the body works as a whole, uh, as well as individual systems and structures. It also taught me about human variation. And because of this, I was able to assist more um, on the autopsies at the medical examiner's office. And I was able to understand and identify regular variations in human body and trauma versus trauma experienced as a result of death. And this knowledge helped me assist on different cases with human remains in various stages of decomposition, not just skeletonized. So I was able to help with uh, a lot of cases that still had soft tissue or fully, um, still had everything in, intact or mostly intact. Um, so now I'm able to look at kind of the entire puzzle and not just a few individual pieces. And when looking at a human remains case, this is incredibly important. So in addition, this means that I'm able to assist with cases from the time of discovery um, and in any type of, um, any part of decomposition uh, through the autopsy, maceration, and examination of the skeletal material, and not just with maceration and skeletal material. So even in programs that do not have access to a medical school, um, so a real gross anatomy class, I feel like physical anthropology graduate students, especially who are interested in forensics, should be expected to gain knowledge in human anatomy, and not just human osteology somehow. Um, and this specific set of skills can really be useful at autopsies, but also at the crime scene itself. Um, and so with human anatomy, the images that you see on the screen, um, these are just examples. So understanding the skeletal system is important and being able to identify trauma made by different types of objects, but it's really helpful to understand how those objects also went through the soft tissue to get to the bone. All of this is going to assist if you combine the knowledge both of soft and hard tissue, it's gonna help you with determining what happens to that person. So with death scene investigation in large areas like New York City, the medical examiner's office and police departments are lucky uh, because while small, um, they have a very specific forensic anthropology division, which is, it's very cool. Uh, forensic anthropologists are called to scenes to assist crime scene technicians with the identification and excavation of clandestine graves, um, surface uh, remains and also scattered skeletal remains or possible clandestine graves. Um, this is not the situation for most criminal justice departments. Um, many forensic anthropologists though could be an invaluable addition to the team. Uh, it just requires training in order to be able to identify very small human carpal bones from tiny stones um, in various types of weather, et cetera. And these are things that many crime scene technicians don't have training in and they're not, or they, if they have training, it's very um, minimal. And so I wanted to insert like a tiny little short story break here with tiny carpal bone. So while in graduate school, um, a construction crew uncovered a human skeleton while backhoeing dirt uh, for a new line of pipes along a popular road in Buffalo. And this road actually went on campus under um, one of the parking lots and along like a road that goes all the way through the middle of campus. And I was part of the team that got to excavate the uncovered skeletons. And eventually many were discovered, um, several hundred, I believe. And we found out that the skeletons belonged to the Erie County poorhouse that existed where part of South Campus now stands um, from late 18th century to early 19th century. Uh, we discovered them in mid-March, so the weather wasn't the greatest. Thankfully, it wasn't snowing. Um, but the first several rows that were discovered were under the water line. So when we were trying to recover the skeletal remains, a lot of the caskets, and th thankfully they were in caskets, they were completely submerged or partially submerged in water. 
And so we had to recover the bones. We couldn't, we tried to take the water out, but it just kept filling because it was under the water line. So uh, we basically had to use feel um, to determine whether or not what we were touching was a bone, a, a piece of rock, uh, part of the casket, et cetera. And some of our bones are incredibly tiny, like in the very tips of our fingers. Um, and so in class, we were asked to identify bones blindly. Um, we'd actually reach into, I can't remember what kind of bag it was, but um, we'd reach into a bag and have to tell you basically what bone we were touching. And none of us thought it would be useful um, until this day. Uh, and I also heard a similar story from anthropologists at Mercyhurst University in Erie, PA, where they had a case um, and it was a found set of remains at the base of a hill. It was kind of like a marshy land area. And their recovery process was to, you know, take and sketch the scene, um, sketch where each bone was before actually removing it from the scene, taking pictures, etc. And so because the remains were underwater and again, they couldn't pump the water out, it just kept filling back up. They had to reach in, feel for the bone, and also be able to describe um, this top portion of the bone, the superior part was facing, you know, west or north or wherever. Um, and so it really made it obvious why knowing the skeleton in such detail, even without looking at it, was incredibly important. Um, so the skill set really requires a lot of practice and expert knowledge of each individual bone. And again, there's 206 of them, sometimes more. Um, but if we take all of this and we apply this to death scene investigation, we see how it's important. So applying forensic anthropology skills at a crime scene, like I said, is necessary. But in addition to regular physical anthropology training, we need additional professional training in death scene investigation and criminal justice as well. But really, so the question becomes, why is this necessary? Uh, when they're police officers, crime scene analysts, won't this lead to the saying too many cooks in the kitchen? Um, but in my opinion, no. As I stated earlier, the importance of context is one that's only just being understood in cases with forensic anthropologists, and not necessarily the forensic anthropologists are just learning this, but um, others are. In order to understand the context of a scene, the forensic anthropologist has to be trained in scene analysis. So basic criminal justice procedures are very important um, so that forensic anthropologists can work with other law enforcement at the scene um, and at the autopsy as well all need to work as a team and this can really only occur with proper training. So at a death scene, the goal is to obtain information, establish facts, hopefully that will lead to probable cause, um, find and eventually process evidence. Uh, this is why I earned my death scene investigation level one certification, hopefully the second one soon. Um, that combined with my education and experience in the criminal justice field, I'm an asset to death scenes because I'm able to meld various areas of expertise when assisting on an investigation. And I really feel that more anth forensic anthropologists need this level of training and background. Uh, I believe my education and training also helps me bridge kind of this gap that can sometimes exist between law enforcement, so police officers, scene investigators, detectives, and forensic scientists. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna talk about the television show Bones a little bit. Um, it's been both a blessing and a curse for the field of anthropology. So if we look at it from a positive angle, it's really introduced a lot of people to the field of anthropology um, and other fields of forensics. Um, it's kind of introduced them to it in little bits and pieces. But opposite that, it's really given an unrealistic view of the behavior, social skills, beliefs of forensic anthropologists. It's obviously glorified the job. Um, <laughs> the main character, who is a forensic anthropologist called Bones, if you haven't seen it, is portrayed as awkward, um, socially inept, and egotistical. Repeatedly, she's unable to talk to detectives and other criminal justice professionals in a shared language. And instead, she uses medical terminology that only trained individuals would be able to comprehend. This lexicon is important when writing forensic reports and when detailing specifics of a crime in court testimony, don't get me wrong, but also in court after speaking in a very specific way. It's necessary for you to be able to translate this medical jargon into a shared language that can be understood by individuals who are not experts in that particular field. And they're experts just not in the same topic. So just because they're not an expert in your field doesn't mean that you sh they should be um, spoken down to. And that's really what this show kind of pushed as um, 
an example for forensic anthropologists. Um, everyone really should be working together on a case. So we're talking forensic anthropologists, criminologists, crime scene techs, etc. And we all need to have a basic understanding of each other's fields of expertise and should be able to translate language um, to one that can really be understood by non-experts. Um, and this is another reason why it's imperative that forensic anthropologists receive training in criminal justice. Uh, so now I'm going to shift my focus slightly to another aspect of the criminal justice field. Um, and really, it's another one that should utilize forensic anthropologists more often, um, and also other non-police professionals. And one that I've had the honor of joining, um, cold case analysis centers. Um, there are also a lot of cold case analysis units that have been developed as well. Let me take a sip of Red Bull. <clears throat> so on the screen, you'll see um, Cold Case Analysis Center at the College of St. Rose. So in the capital region, we're really fortunate to have this center. I became involved with the center on an official basis when looking for more opportunities uh, to use all of my expertise in the field rather than just academically. And if you visit the site, um, the center states the following. So many will wait, um, many still wait for justice in the United States. The United States amassed approximately 185,000 unsolved homicides between 1990 and 2008. And FBI statistics have estimated that more than 6,000 cases on average have gone unsolved each year since the 1980s. During this time period, missing person cases have also continued to accumulate. The National Missing and Unidentified Person System estimates that an average of 2,000 missing person cases go unsolved each year. According to the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services, so DCJS, a total of 2,951 active missing person cases remained open in New York State at the end of 2013. DCJS also indicates that approximately 6% of cases remain open each year, adding to the growing number of unsolved missing person cases. At the end of 2011, a total of 210 of these unsolved cases were in the capital region alone. And as the number of unsolved cases mount, they tend to take a backseat to new cases that may have an immediately higher likelihood of being solved. Case files grow over time while task forces and investigators come and go. In response to this program or this problem, some agencies have formed their own cold case units to address the growing unsolved case problem. However, not all agencies have the resources to do this. And I'll add, not all agencies have the resources to create a large enough cold case unit to accommodate the large numbers of unsolved cases. So the center at uh, the College of St. Rose is comprised of Dr. Christina Lane, who is the director and co-founder, and she's a criminologist. Dr. Chris Kunkel, who is also a co-founder, consultant, and a forensic psychologist, and then me. So forensic anthropologist with a background in human anatomy and criminal justice, and also dusting investigation. There are several sergeants and officers, lieutenants in the surrounding capital region that are part of the center. Um, and specifically, the Albany Police Department and Colony Police Departments have been paramount to the success of the center because of their trust in those that work there. And in addition to the professionals listed, many upper level undergraduate students from the College of St. Rose intern at the center, where they are able to learn more about cold case investigation and the criminal justice system. And they help with transferring a lot of paper documents um, to uh, online so that it's much easier for people to access who are on the investigation team. Um, and basically all of those students are an incredibly valuable part of the center. It would appear that working with a cold case center where you encounter more paperwork than human remains of any type would be an unusual place for a forensic anthropologist, but my unusual background has made me a perfect fit for the center. Typically I translate and discuss the crime scene and autopsy reports while others bring their expertise on human behavior and psychology, something I don't have a background in it at all. Uh, forensic technology and police work have significantly changed over the last several decades. The discovery of DNA and then touch DNA, changes in opinions involving fiber evidence, transitions to comprehensive autopsies, so not just partial, full autopsies, and improved police procedures have given recent cases the ability to use more resources and examine cases in a new and improved light. Many of the cases I have reviewed for the center are decades old, and while evidence was collected, DNA had yet to be discovered in a lot of these cases. Um, and autopsy and scene reports lack specific details, 
uh, or they use very strange wording that is no longer used today. Many photographs are black and white, or if they're in color, they're not focused. So it's very difficult to use these um, when trying to figure out what's happening in the investigation. And in a lot of them, the original officers that worked on the case are not around anymore. Either they're retired or they're no longer with us. And because of social norms, some crimes such as rape uh, were really considered taboo to talk about and even more so to definitively say that they occurred. So basically I'm not adding blame to any of the officers or criminal justice professionals from prior years. And instead, I really commend what they were able to do with so little and thank them for providing us with a foundation upon which to continue to investigate these cases um, using updated methods and technology. And really, let's not forget, cold cases are not just a thing of the distant past. You can have a cold case from a year ago. Many recent cold cases exist and they're labeled so because they lack significant leads or enough resources. And right now we're working multiple cases at the center um, and actually fundraising to help with costs of processing new and updated evidence um, to use with updated technology to hopefully get some stuff that will help with solving some of these cases. So I just wanted to include um, more information about the Cold Case Center and then also um, News Channel 13. They have uh, an entire like cold case special. I've done a couple of talks with them on a specific case which I will be talking about and these are really interesting cases and they've gone into more detail with them. Um, and then there's also a podcast as well if you're interested in these cases and you want to learn more. Uh, so that's why I wanted to include these. So I'm going to highlight a few of the major cold cases I'm currently working on with the center and the local police departments. Um, and like I said, more information can be found on the things I showed you on the previous slide. And hopefully there will be more information being released in the future um, if we're able to process evidence. Uh, as I've stated, my role in these cases is a little unusual. I've not had any contact with human remains um, or examined the actual physical evidence. Well, I've seen a couple of pieces of it, but really it's not been laid out all over the table for me. Instead, I've read through the case files, spoken with um, these amazing investigators on the case, combined my knowledge and experience with those of investigators and other professionals at the center in an attempt to kind of reconstruct the events surrounding the death of each of the victims in these cases. I've translated the medical reports and sometimes the crime reports too. Um, in addition to using medical terminology, uh, many officers and forensic scientists, like I said, the language is kind of older. So it's a little harder to understand. It's less specific. And like I said before, it's a little less taboo. Um, and an example of that again would be language related to rape and sexual assault. So the first case uh, that I wanted to talk a little bit about is highlighted here with these couple of images. Um, and if you want to see more, you can, I, I'm showing what I'm allowed to show right now, but there is more um, that you can see if you go to the other websites that I had up on the previous slide. So this case that I reviewed is from 1964. Uh, it's in Albany, New York. It's a 50 year old woman who was found murdered in the upstairs apartment of the house that she owned. And that's in the upper picture there. Um, it was two floors with a basement. She had been bludgeoned with a blunt object, stabbed in the neck, and sexually assaulted. She was also mutilated post-mortem. Uh, the manner of death uh, was ruled a homicide. So for those that don't know, manner of death refers to if it's homicide, suicide, um, natural, undetermined. Um, so this was a homicide. And the cause of death was exsanguination, so bleeding out due to a cut left common carotid artery, so that's in the neck. Uh, this case was extensively investigated when it first occurred, and the case itself, the case file itself is <laughs> like this thick. It's several inches thick, um, and we've also been working on trying to identify the weapon that's used, been, that was used to bludgeon the victim. Um, I've been doing different recreations to try to uh, get a similar injury that's shown on her skull using different tools that could have been used by the unidentified subject from the 60s. So it's been an interesting um, time. I examined photographs of the scene and the victim, um, the crime scene report and the autopsy report. We've actually talked with family members, et cetera, um, and the, the niece who found her. And in order to tr translate basically what was determined by officers and the medical examiner slash coroner, that's why I read all of this. 
Um, I re-examine the time of death because a lot has changed. There's a lot, well, I say now there's a lot of stuff, but in the past 10 years, a lot has changed as far as time of death and understanding basically the stages of decomposition and what happens to a body. So um, I re-examined their time of death based on the case file and photographs, and I helped reconstruct the crime scene from the last time the victim was seen until she was found by her niece. So the victim was a quiet and independent woman, well-liked by neighbors and family. She lived alone in the two-story building uh, that you see there. Normally she rented out the second floor apartment and at the time of her murder, she was actively looking for a new tenant for the second floor. One evening after getting home from work, neighbors saw her sweeping their front, her front steps. She went inside and based on my reconstruction of the scene, an unidentified subject at some point arrived, most likely showing interest in the upstairs apartment. The victim retrieved the keys to the apartment upstairs and she unknowingly let her murderer up. Uh, upon entering a back bedroom, the unknown suspect hit the victim. Um, at some point, he sexually assaulted her and stabbed her in the neck. And when she was dead, he mutilated her body before fleeing. Uh, this case remains unsolved, but at the center, we're doing all we can to assist police with finding her killer and bringing both her and her family justice. Fresh eyes on the case file, new technology, and students with amazing organizational skills have helped make progress in the case so far, and new technology is really um, helping as well. And the, some, some new evidence is actually being processed, so fingers are crossed for the case. Um, the next case, the second one I'd like to discuss, is from 1959. Um, in Colony, New York. It's an 18-year-old woman. She was found face down in a few inches of water, dead in a ditch off the side of the road. She had been bludgeoned with a blunt object, and her manner of death was homicide. Cause of death was actually asphyxiation due to drowning, so she couldn't breathe, um, not due to the head trauma. This case was also investigated thoroughly, but quickly ran cold. Um, similar to the first, I examined the reports of the case, and um, I looked at the autopsy report, the um, crime scene report, et cetera, trying to help with the reconstruction um, and attempting to recreate the injury to um, her skull as well with various tools that the unidentified subject could have used. Um, so these pictures show where she was found. You can see it's not a very big hill. Um, reconstructing the scene was more difficult because the victim was murdered in the winter. Uh, not with feet of snow like we have now, but it was still pretty cold. Um, the water actually wasn't frozen, so um, that's how she was able to actually drown in it. She was found face down in the water, which also will wash away of a fair amount of evidence, um, but she was alive when she was dumped on the side of the road. It kind of rolled into, into the ditch, and we know this because she had uh, water in her lungs. Um, but because there's only a few inches of water, there's no sign, there were no sign of struggles, no footprints leading down the ditch or anything like that. She was rolled into the ditch and she stayed there. Um, so it's likely that her skull injuries, which were pretty severe, uh, rendered her unconscious. So she was unable to remove herself from the water and that's why um, she drowned. Uh, this case, like the other, is also unsolved. Realistically, in my opinion, funding um, should be diverted to cold case centers and units in order to decrease the burden that currently lies on many police departments. Murder will never cease to exist, and as new cases appear, there are old ones that are solved while others run cold. Centers like the College of St. Rose can assist and let a group of professionals and non-police criminal justice experts carry some cold weight. So let us help. We all have the same goal. Um, and this is the last case that I want to talk about. It's called, it's Mr. X. Um, Mr. X was discovered by a farmer who was walking his land in 1981. It's in Bethlehem, New York. So it's south of Albany. And it was a, I believe a horse farm. So it was a lot of land and he was just walking and suddenly found um, a body. His legs, Mr. X's legs were stuck straight up in the air. It was very unusual. But in my opinion, based on what I read, et cetera, he was most likely sitting um, back upright, legs out in front of him and probably got pushed over by animals or you know natural weather kind of a thing. And that's why his feet were stuck in the upward position. He was partially mummified. So um, I think that's why he was in such an unusual position. 
Uh, at first, it was thought that the manner of the death of death could be homicide, and investigators were leaning toward strangulation um, because they believed his hyoid had been broken. And so, here's a side teaching moment. Um, the hyoid rests in the soft tissue of your throat, fairly high up, and is highlighted on the image on the screen. Um, if you want, you can feel your own. So basically, the easiest way is to look for the crease in your neck, and it's going to sit behind there. It's like a hard piece of um, tissue. Don't press too hard. Um, the purpose of this bone is to basically act as an attachment site for muscles and ligaments in your throat. It helps with stabilizing anatomical structures in the neck and also um, structures related to speech all within there. Um, when this bone's broken or fractured, which does not happen often, it is most likely due to a traumatic event, um, more specifically something like strangulation. Um, a few other trauma instances, and really none that I can think of right now unless you get full punched in the throat, uh, are really responsible for hyoid fractures or complete breaks. Um, so when I was asked to review this case, basically what was still available for it because it was old, um, I discovered that the body was very decomposed. So in the skeletal and mummified stages of decomposition, um, so that's pretty much the last part of decomposition before it's just bone that eventually degrades, but that takes a very, very long time. Pieces of the clothing still remained, um, and they showed various rips and cut marks, but again, because the body had been there for a long time, it was really hard to tell if it was from a weapon or if it was from the clothes being old or animal activity, etc. cetera. Um, one side of the body demonstrated more animal activity than the other. Some pieces were missing, most likely dragged off by animals. The hyoid bone was actually absent. Um, it was completely gone, as were the rest of the soft structures in the neck, like muscle, ligament, and cartilage. Uh, and there was also evidence of animal activity on a lot of, of the remains, um, but also in the vertebral column behind the neck structures, suggesting animals might have been responsible for the missing portions of the neck. So the original report for this case stated that the hyoid was completely destroyed, and I would interpret that as meaning it was missing. Um, that tends to be the case when remains are left outside to the elements and other animals. Uh, it's difficult to understand what this medical examiner meant because destroyed could also mean broken into a bunch of pieces. Typically, that's not the wording we use, but um, if you're not a skeletal expert, however, identifying tiny pieces of the hyoid bone can be very difficult. So it's really unlikely that that's the case, that it was just a bunch of tiny pieces of it. It's more likely that it was gone, um, dragged off by animals. Most of the decomposition seems normal in a case such as this. A lot of the descriptions are typical for a body being outside after death for quite some time in the winter. Uh, there's no fractures or damage to any of the bones that would suggest to me that this is a homicide. However, lack of soft tissue structures makes that determination nearly impossible. So just because the bone isn't damaged doesn't mean the victim wasn't injured in some other way that caused his death. The interesting part of the report um, was the left side of the individual is more decomposed than the right. Not knowing the context of the crime scene, I can't say if this was because the left side was more exposed to the elements or animals, or if it's because the left side of the body experienced some kind of trauma related to the death of Mr. X and attracted more animals. Uh, so I determined that the manner of death was undetermined, cause of death unknown. Um, this does not rule out homicide, but it's really just as likely natural or accidental. Perhaps Mr. X was homeless, he fell asleep outside in the winter, the elements got to him. Maybe he died of a heart attack. His heart wasn't there, so we have no idea. Um, so it's really hard to be positive what caused his death. Um, and as I reach the end of my talk, uh, I want to open the virtual floor for questions. I hope that you found it interesting um, and you leave with a better understanding, not just of the definition of a forensic anthropologist, but with the knowledge that the definition is, is changing and really expanding that yes, I'm a skeletal expert, but I'm more than that and I'm capable of assisting with cases in numerous ways, um, not just providing the biological profile in a box of bones. And with that, know that new forensic anthropologists and their education and experience should be adapting in order to maintain the evolving definition of the field. Basically understand the tree, but also understand the forest, especially you know if you want a job and you want to excel at it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fabian. Um, let's open it up for questions. I 
feel like I'm in class right now. <laughs> no questions. So uh, I actually have one. Um, you mentioned the level one crime scene investigation certification. Uh, what, what all does that involve? So I actually did it at um, the death, <clears throat> death investigation training academy um, in Missouri. And I, so basically it's a certification that teaches you how to approach a scene, um, the different jobs that are required of all individuals. So the police officers that attend a scene, um, the crime scene techs, um, detectives, et cetera, and how to basically cordon off the scene, process it at first, make it so that only certain people can come and go. And then it also went into detail about finding evidence, how to process different types of evidence and the body as a crime scene. So we discussed different types of deaths, how to identify different kinds of deaths at the scene, um, basically what to look for. Uh, also, not just at the scene itself, but the people around the scene too. So. And that's not really covered in like an academic program or something like that? Typically, no, it's not. Um, yeah. Most programs, unless you go to like the University of Tennessee is a, is a big forensic program. Um, there are a lot of PhD programs that are just based more on physical anthropology, so they don't specialize in forensics. You kind of have to find that on your own. Uh, Mariah Francis, looks like you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Fabian. I really enjoyed your talk. I had three questions, actually. Okay. Um, you mentioned the University of Tennessee. I know they have the body farm there. Um, I was just interested because from what I've heard, I was an anthropology student at the University of Kentucky, and they provide sort of like a forensic aspect to physical anthropology and that they'll just leave decomposed cadavers and literally a farm and then people are anthropologists are tasked to sort of like i guess recreate um the crime scene so i was wondering from that perspective since they're not purely focused on osteology like would you would you say that that was more um of the path that physical anthropology should be leaning towards definitely i think that the the body farm is incredibly important to the field and I, I wish that we had more because the limiting factor for that is that it's in Tennessee and Tennessee has very specific weather. So uh, weather changes even between different parts of the state as I have found out between Buffalo and Albany and I think if we had more um, more body farms basically uh, and more forensic anthropologists looking at how the body changes after death in various types of of weather and elements and environments, I think that would be um, unbelievably amazing for the field, invaluable actually. And I like how that program does, that's one of the programs that actually does encourage their students and I believe requires them to have more human anatomy because they're dealing with soft tissue, um, not just the skeletal remains. Thank you. Um, my next question is for people who are interested in pursuing a career as forensic anthropologist, I've like, I'm totally um, a dilettante, <laughs> but I was just curious about what sort of opportunities exist because I know for folks who do want to work in crime scene investigation, you mentioned that there's sort of too many cooks in the kitchen. Do you believe that other than gaining some sort of additional certification, if you weren't trained at say the University of Tennessee, there are other avenues for you to participate? Um, or, I mean, I don't really know how that happens. Is it like very competitive? And I guess a sub question from that is if you did protect, like particularly had more um, of a distinct training with human anatomy and soft tissues, at what point would say a crime scene team specifically call on an anthropologist without the assumption that you just focus purely with bones? So if we're talking about forensic anthropology as far as, as that field, for opportunities, it depends on where you're located. So in New York State, New York City is really the way to go if that's a place that you wanna live because they have a separate actual forensic anthropology department mm -hmm. that's part of the medical examiner's office. And I think that if more medical examiner's office actually started to hire forensic anthropologists, it would be very beneficial um, for a lot of their cases. And um, I think that it could be the same if police departments had them on, on staff or at least on call as well. 
um, so that they could actually be there for a lot of these scenes and assist and be an added team member. But it would also require the rest of the criminal justice system to really understand what we do and mm -hmm. how we can help. Um, and I think, like I said, it's slowly changing, but it, it, it really is slow. Uh, I meet a lot of, of police officers who have no idea who I am or what I can do. Um, and they still expect that I'm just going to be given like a box of bones that I can then process. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's why I've been trying to kind of <laughs> spread the word and say, you know, I'm trained in all these other things as well. And being trained in these other things helps you interact with a lot of these professionals um, in other fields too. So I think that answered your question. <laughs> no, that's, that's pretty on par. I was just okay. curious because um, you mentioned, I mean, I don't know how often you just get like a, you know, a human skeleton in perfect form without anything missing in a way that can make it easy. So you said when you're doing cold cases, for instance, and you're not directly in the field, I imagine as a forensic anthropologist, that can be really difficult if you literally have no access to any human remains, if that scene had occurred a long time ago before we had certain technology. Um, how do you reapproach that when you're not really given a lot of the sort of relevant information that you otherwise use? For mm -hmm. example, if they're just medical reports, you know, be those perfect as they are. I mean, I was just really curious on how you, you're like literally investigating. So I was just curious like how that shows up in your work and how frustrating that could be. So a long time ago, I, I was actually an undergrad when I was with the sheriff's department. I was told by the crime scene analyst that I had to get used to the idea that I would not be there for every case from start to finish and most likely would never be there from start to finish and that was something that i had to kind of address <laughs> because i like solving puzzles and i like solving the entire thing uh but i have come through my experiences to understand that it's just as important to be a part of the case in one aspect and that a bunch of different people can add theirs to create the entire puzzle and finish like solve the case mm -hmm. um so that's something that it still can be really frustrating. It can be really frustrating when you look at a case and they didn't process evidence a certain way or they word it where they're not being definitive in, in certain things. So saying, yes, this definitely occurred or they say there was trauma to the skull, but they don't really measure it as, as much as we would now. Um, the pictures aren't, they don't have a scale in them. That kind of thing is really frustrating, but everything else kind of makes up for it in whatever way you're able to help with the case. Um, but it's very difficult because obviously my background, I'm an expert in, in bone, um, but I'm also there in case we do decide to exhume a skeleton. There, We've questioned it before, we didn't actually go through with it, but um, that's another avenue that me being there, I'm hoping will in the future I'll be kind of a person that they can call upon if we actually do decide to go back and look at a set of remains again. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Patricia Sanford uh, in the comments mentions your interdisciplinary approach to solving forensic cases makes perfect sense. Uh, have you encountered any resistance or turf protection from law enforcement officials? Yes, <laughs> a lot. Uh, and that's where I feel like my broad background has been very helpful. Um, so I can say, no, I actually was going to be a police officer. Um, I'm not, you know, shoving my PhD in your face. We can work together. I promise that I'll talk to you like a normal person if you talk, like respect both ways, you know? And I think that's really helped um, kind of bridge. That's the gap I was talking about between um, certain criminal justice professionals and like forensic scientists, which I also think has been exacerbated by television shows like like Bones. Uh, Priscilla Lynn, also in the in the comments, uh, have you ever been in a, in a situation when you were and, and sorry, Priscilla, I I think it got cut off. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where forensic? Can you fill in the blank there, Priscilla? You're on mute, Priscilla. Thank you. 
Okay, great. I'm I'm unmuted now. Sorry, I couldn't I couldn't unmute it. I was clicking on the red the red uh, symbol and it wasn't working. Um, no, it's a great talk and really really interesting. And I totally agree with you about uh, bones. I think it did a, a real disservice to um, science in many ways. But my question is that, in, as a, as an anthropologist, did you ever find that you were really in conflict with the people you were working with in terms of your ideas or interpretation? And if so, how did you go about resolving that? Uh, yes, I have actually, especially with cold cases, because there's a lot of um, questions involved. And sometimes with cold cases, you have to be very careful when you're working with, if there are police that worked on that case previously, um, you have to be careful with your wording because if you're discovering something new or um, something that goes against what they originally thought about the case, sometimes that can be interpreted as, you know, you questioning their skills and abilities mm -hmm. as, you know, a police officer and stuff like that. And so um, sometimes that's come in, in to play a little bit. And so you just really have to be careful with how you word things and how you approach the subject. Um, you kind of have to show like, I'm, I'm not questioning your abilities. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to solve the case like you and with new technology and new methods, which are developed pretty much every year. And if we're talking about in the last 20 or 30 years, it's remarkable what's changed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, you know, they kind of say, oh, okay, you know, like you're not, <laughs> you're not threatening to me. You're not um, kind of just picking apart my, my abilities and, and, my ways of investigating. So um, I've, I've encountered that a bit, especially since um, a lot of people don't know what a forensic anthropologist is. Mm -hmm. And I, I also tend to look younger. So some people mistake me as a student. <laughs> so um, that becomes an issue as well because they don't realize that they're talking to someone who is actually trained in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bill Roberts in the comments. Um, uh, bear with me, this is a little bit longer. Uh, thanks, Dr. Fabian. Fascinating presentation. Google tells me there are 119 certified forensic anthropologists in 27, which is about 5% of the number of medical examiners and 2% of working anthropologists, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. My sense was that you do not necessarily see this as an area of growth for professional anthropologists. Did I misunderstand you? Uh, what organization certifies forensic anthropologists? And to your knowledge, do forensic anthropolo anthropology aspirants tend to do the combined med school anthro programs or more a straightforward PhD in physical anthro? So kind of <laughs> I'll do it like a bit at a time. Um, so for, for let's do, okay. Um, there, I think that it is an area of growth. I think what has to happen is we have, we kind of, the field is changing. It's just a very, very slow change. Um, there are a lot of new, younger people getting trained in more recent methods. And I think um, that that's slowly becoming incorporated into the field. It's just gonna take a little while. And I think once it does, once more police departments and medical examiners recognize what we're actually able to do and bring to the table for these cases, I think that the field is going to kind of explode if, if, if they let us help. Um, and as far as certifications, so right now, in order to be a certified board certified forensic anthropologist, you have to work on three separate cases from start to finish. So from the actual discovery of the human remains at the scene, all the way through to the end of the, the trial. And it's just incredibly difficult to do that because a lot of departments want board certified already. Um, and they don't understand that for me, I, I could have testified as a master's with just my master's. I could have been um, an expert in court, but with my PhD, it's the same thing. I have the same kind of training. I just don't have three full cases from start to finish. Um, and so a lot of people don't recognize that I can still help, um, even though I'm not board certified. And you kind of have to let me help in order to be board certified. <laughs> so it's kind of a catch-22 with a lot of it. So um, in order to be board certified after you get those three cases, you then take two different exams. So it's a written test and then they actually lay out um, a skeleton and different remains for you to kind of go through the biological profile, examine, um, write up a, a report, et cetera. So eventually that is my goal. That's why I got my PhD 
because you have to have it in order to become board certified. Um, but right now, my problem is just getting a case that goes from the very beginning all the way to the end um, to qualify for it. Um, oh, what else? And as far as I know, most forensic anthropologists do not do a combined med school anthro program. Honestly, that sounds terrible to me. I couldn't imagine doing that. Uh, <laughs> it would be, oh God. And if you're going to do med school, I think most people who are going that route and want to do forensics would do um, medical examiners um, pathway. And with that, you could still, if you were really interested in it, because medical examiners are going to be more, uh, more experts in soft tissue. Um, I think that that would be something too that could change in the field of medical examiners getting more education in actual human osteology because they really don't have a focus on it. Um, and so that's also why people in my field should be called in. Um, but yeah, most, I don't really know of anyone who did both because that would just, grad school is hard. <laughs> that would just be terrible. <laughs> oh God. So I think that was every, I think that was all of it. So also in the comments, uh, my perception is that there are more women going into forensics than men. Uh, do you think that's accurate? Hmm. I would say that I have met more women forensic anthropologists. Uh, I think the criminal justice field, at least from my perception, is still more male dominated. Um, but I'm not really sure I, I mean, I can't talk in statistics, but I would definitely say that most of the forensic anthropologists I know are female. And then forensic scientists, um, yeah, most of, most of the ones that I've met are female. And Katerina Varsos, looks like you have a question. Yes, um, I'm actually a forensic anthropologist student now. And I, uh, I'm trying to figure out what path I want to take. I think I want to do grad school in Tennessee and work on the body farm, but I really, really love um, genocidal studies. And I was actually inspired by my genocide teacher to work in places like Bosnia and dig up the mass graves there. So what would be kind of the biggest difference as far as forensic anthropology goes? Um, between like, so I would also look at, uh, there's a school in Texas. I actually had a student, and one of my undergraduate students is a grad student there. I can't, which Texas university is it? Texas and uh, Arizona, they do a lot of work with, um, not necessarily mass graves, but a lot of unidentified people who are coming across the borders. Um, so those are ways to go. And I think for genocide, one issue would be obviously letting you in. So I know that some some countries are really against letting uh, people from other countries come in and help with recovering uh, mass graves. But I think if you approach it the right way and maybe reach out to some of the anthropologists and maybe in Texas and Arizona, they might be able to help with that. Um, because I want to say the one in Texas also has done stuff with, with mass graves. Um, so I, I would start there, and I would definitely look in, in, at those two places as well as Tennessee for, for schools. Mm. Yeah, Monica, you wanna um, go ahead? I think, it, I know Arizona State has a big program under the direction of Jane Bikestra, who look specifically at how the role of bioarchaeology, which overlaps with forensic anthropology, but more from a, you know, an archeological past context, looking at the uh, role that archeologists, bioarchaeologists have in the, the capacity of helping with issues of genocide, because a lot of dictators don't like forensic anthropologists and they don't like bioarchaeologists because they're able to identify and collect a lot of evidence that ultimately takes things to criminal courts. Um, and then I think also the one in Texas that you might be thinking of is in Austin. Okay. But you know, just 
extra info. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so I had a question. Um, in your work with, uh, with the center, uh, <clears throat> how much do you find that there's collaboration between uh, cold case centers across the country? Is that, is that a thing or are they pretty isolated? Um, I would actually say they're pretty isolated. I know there's not too many, so that might be part of the issue. They're becoming more of a thing, um, but the numbers are very few. And um, I think that that would be something that's really, that would be more helpful. Uh, police departments now talk to one another more, but they could do it. With the one case I was talking about, the very first one with the woman who was bludgeoned in the second level of her house, that one we question whether or not, you know, did the person do it again? Um, it was a very unusual case. And in trying to talk to other departments and across the country, even across the state, um, sometimes it's still really hard to get people to look through all, like there's not one database for everyone, um, which would take a lot of work, I understand. But I think that if there was a bigger database and if we talk to each other more, um, I think that would definitely be more beneficial for everyone. Um, and I think with cold case centers across, across the nation, actually, I think that would be helpful because we know for a fact that, I mean, these unidentified subjects move from one state to another. Um, I think as Israel Keys went to all different types of areas and killed people. So um, I think right now there isn't any, but there, there should be, there should be more talk amongst the different groups. And that was kind of my follow-up question. If, is there any kind of interest in, in building some kind of database like that? I think there would be. Um, right now, I think developing the, the centers is because they're, fair, they're fairly new. I mean, cold case mm. units are <clears throat> new. It's, it hasn't been a real big thing um, until, I say recently, but it might have been like the past 10 or 20 years. That's recent, I guess. Um, yeah. But I could see it being very beneficial and i could see people saying yeah like i just know that the people i work with would be they would love it <laughs> so uh, uh ruth looks like you have your your hand up yes hi um i went to the university of florida and they have a forensic program there uh, right now, uh, they're all women directors, and uh, they do a fair amount of work on uh, law enforcement cases for the state of Florida, as well as um, one of the people who's working in Tulsa right now, Dr. Phoebe Stubblefield, on the Tulsa riot um, mass exhumation in Oklahoma. Uh, so if you're looking at programs, um, I would just suggest that. Shout out to my alma mater, University of Florida. Thanks. Other questions? Just really a comment. It was a great presentation. And uh, basically, you answered my questions, or I had some similar questions as Bill Roberts uh, about going into the field. So you already answered. The one I could think of right away. Thanks. Thank you. I have a question. Have you uh, done any um, work abroad in that capacity, uh, say with mass graves or even um, scenarios like human disasters where they have to, um, not human disasters, excuse me, natural disasters where there's, you know, a need to uh, do identification. Uh, and if you haven't, um, do you think you would volunteer for that in some capacity in the future, just for the sake of being able to do it? Uh, I haven't worked on any of that, but I am very interested. Uh, so, through SMART, the program I was part of at UB, um, I was part of their mass fatality division and they kind of really started that because of the flight that landed in Buffalo and uh, every pretty much uh, like everyone on the flight died. And a lot of my um, colleagues who I went to school with were actually there before me. It happened the year before I went to, to grad school and they, they helped with the recovery. 
And so um, I became part of Serve, is it Serve New York? Um, so I'm basically part of like that whole group where if there is a mass fatality and they do need anthropologists, um, I'm, I'm on the list. So I would definitely go and help. Um, I know like a, a few years ago with the hurricanes, um, there were a lot of anthropologists that volunteered their time. And if that were to happen again, now that I have my degree, um, I would definitely be more than willing to help with that. And same with going abroad too. That's definitely an interest I have. Uh, I had a question. Um, can you speak to any hazards of the job, like uh, you know, psychological hazards, uh, physical hazards, uh, anything like that? Well, physical hazards would be, I guess, uh, I just think of the, the bones that I helped recover at UB and they were covered in mold. Probably should have worn masks. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, when you go to a crime scene, you wear full gear. <laughs> Same with autopsies. You wear like, it's basically like COVID. So you wear two or three sets of gloves. You have an apron, but under that is another like full um, plastic thing that covers all your clothes. You wear specific scrubs, you wear specific shoes, shoe coverings, you cover your hair, your face. Um, you have a shield on top of the mask, like everything like that. So that's always a worry though, um, at something like an autopsy, but I learned very early on that no matter, like when you're doing some type of evidence collection at a scene or at the autopsy, you're always, you always assume that something there is going to hurt you. So you approach the scene like it's kind of dangerous. So you don't just stick your hand in someone's pocket, like in uh, the clothing of, of the person. Um, you like take the pocket out very carefully and then empty it that way. Same thing at a scene, you don't wanna get poked by anything. You always assume that the person, the victim, or anybody else that entered that scene, especially if there's blood or anything like that, you assume that they had some type of disease that you don't want to catch because um, you don't want to risk it. And so you approach it from that kind of safety mindset. Um, psychologically, I think that's a topic that isn't discussed very often. I actually wrote a foreword for a book by the people who did the death scene investigation trainings about um, the psychological hazards of being a first responder and a police officer um, and any type of forensic worker, coroner, et cetera, and how we don't really talk about the psychological aspects and how it can really take a toll because you see some terrible stuff. Um, basically, you have to learn how to still do your job, but not push it down to the point where it kind of tears you apart. There's going to be some things that bother you more than others. Um, I always look at it as when I walk away that I am doing something. I might not be solving the case, but I'm doing something for someone who can't help themselves anymore. They can't talk. You know, it's my job. So I'm, I'm doing something to help that person. And that's what I try to remember every time, regardless of, of how bad the case is. Um, and I would say that a lot of officers the same way. Um, but I also think that that's an area of the field that really isn't talked about a lot and how, you know, there's still the assumption that, you know, police should be able to handle it. Um, first responders should be able to handle it. When in reality, you see terrible stuff. And I mean, when that starts to not affect you, that's when, you know, you really need to start talking to someone because, I, I mean, that's just a part of being human, so. Uh, any other questions? If not, this might be a good place to wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Fabian, did you have any any other parting wisdom for, especially for the people that are, are interested in getting into this field? Um, I would say know that it's what you want to do and don't give up. I, like, you'll get there. <laughs> it will happen, I promise. <laughs> So, uh, again, thank you very much for, uh, for speaking to us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, everyone, uh, join me, please, in giving a hand to Dr. Fabian. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Stop the recording here.